Lord, thank you for tonight and everybody that's here. Uh, we ask for your guidance and uh, Lord, that you would help us have understanding of your word. And uh, Lord, uh, I know there's others that may still be trying to get here. And we just pray you'd bring them in safely tonight. And Lord Jesus, uh, please bless all of those who are a part of our class online, who will watch uh, the Bible study later. And we pray you'd bless them as they grow in the knowledge of your word as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Pray, amen. amen. All right, well, if you want to open your Bibles up to Genesis, uh, I'm going to begin reading in verse 50. We actually uh, read verse 50 and 51 last week, but uh, I, want to, I want to back up a couple of verses. This chapter, I'm sorry. Uh, chapter 24 and verse 50 is where we're going to start reading here in a minute. So if you remember last week, uh, Abraham chose his oldest servant, most trusted guy, sent him to find a wife for his son, Isaac. And he meets this woman, he asks God for a sign. Remember that story? And uh, the woman does exactly what he asked for in the sign uh, in regards to giving him water and then offering to water his camels, right? By the way, um, Heather watched the teaching, and she, she said, <laughs> "She said, I said, did I get it right?" She said, "Well, the thing that you missed." And so I said, "Well, I will, I will tell this." Um, <clears throat> when she asked for the sign, uh, whether or not I was going to be her husband, she actually asked for it on the morning. In fact, about 15 minutes before I arrived, she asked for the sign. And she had asked God to have me bring her roses. And then she said, uh, even if it's just one rose, I'll take that as a sign that he's going to be my husband. And she said the reason that she burst into tears and it was struck her so much is because... She had prayed that that morning. She was praying, and it was about 15 minutes before I arrived. So when I walked in, she knew what she had just asked God, and I walked in with one red rose. And it, she was just like, she hadn't seen a prayer to go that fast. <laughs> so it's like she's praying on her knees in her bedroom in Krugerville, and I'm sitting at the bank, and her prayer to God, and then he just goes, Get a flower. <laughs> it was like that fast. That so, great. yeah. So she she said, I think you need, you need to tell them it happened. That I was praying that morning for it. I had not asked for it. it had, I didn't wait weeks. It took 15 minutes to get my sign. Wow. And it's a good thing you listen to God. Well, and I had, she said the reason she asked for flowers is because I had never brought her flowers in our two months of dating or whatever. I was poor. What do you go one little. Tell me what that's exactly what I said. You yeah. asked God for roses, and then you said, "Well, he's pretty poor. So even if he could bring me one red rose, that's all I could afford was one red rose." All right. Let's go. Uh, Did you get it at the convenience store? Do what? <laughs> Did you get it at the? Convenience no, I actually went to the florist right across from Point Bank and Power Point. <laughs> Yeah, it was pricey. That's why I got one. It was the unction, wasn't it? Yes, it was. The Lord moved me in. Okay, so now we're going to pick up, because I told that story last week if you missed it, and uh, you can always go watch it on YouTube, get the full thing. All right, verse 50. Then Laban and Bethuel replied, The matter comes from the Lord, so we cannot speak to you bad or good. Here is Rebecca before you. Take her and go and let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. So I, I tell you, I read that last verse again just to remind you. He had asked for the signs. The Lord gave him the signs. Rebecca was the one. He goes to her family, Laban, which is her brother in Bethuel. And, and they in turn say, you know what? Take her. If the Lord spoke, then she's to be the wife of uh, your your. Uh, master's son, which would be Abraham's son, Isaac. So then we come to verse 52, which is when we start in a new text for tonight. 
When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the ground before the Lord. So you can tell he's worshiping the Lord over this answer to prayer. The servant brought out articles of silver and articles of gold and garments and gave them to Rebekah. And he also gave precious things to her brother and to her mother. Then he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. And that was common practice at that time. Uh, they even Paul, you know, uh, a thousand years later, Paul will talk about the churches that he would visit and plant. He would say, send me on, send me on my way. So it was a something that you did. You, you, uh, you'd help them. For permission to leave. Yeah, that and, and just the sending on the way was also uh, filling your, you know, bags with some food and, and some, maybe some money and water or whatever you needed to be able to go on your journey. So they're they're providing for you and sending you out. So he he wants the blessing of them sending him um, and whatever is needed to begin to start that journey back. Because remember, there's not convenience stores along the way. And food only lasts for so long on a journey. So he got food to come all the way to, um, I don't have the right map up for it, but um, he had food to take him. I'm going to show you all that in a minute. But these are all maps for tonight. Yeah, never mind. Um, yeah, that one there shows it. So he got, remember, the region that he's in is somewhere around in this area over here. Uh, in the land of Mesopotamia. And so he had uh, enough food to get him from this region all the way up and around. And, and it's possible he bought along the way. But to start his journey back, it's a very long journey. So he's saying, send me on my way. Um, he's got other people with him too. Yes, he has quite a caravan of people, plus the, the ladies that he picked up. Um, send me on my way, uh, send me away to my master. But her brother... Laban and her mother said, let the girl stay with us a few days, say 10. Afterwards, she may go. He said to them, do not delay me since the Lord has prospered my way. Send me away that I may go to my master. And they said, we will call the girl and consult her wishes. When then they called Rebecca and said to her, will you go with this man? And she said, I will go. Thus they sent away their sister Rebecca and her nurse with Abraham's servant and his men. Uh, they blessed Rebecca and said to her, May you, our sister, become thousands of ten thousands, and may your descendants possess the gates of those who hate them. Then Rebecca arose with her maids, and they mounted the camels and followed the man. So the servant took Rebecca and departed. So there's your send off. Um, he, they end up leaving the decision up to Rebecca, and uh, she says she will go right away. She doesn't have to wait ten days like they're wanting. And uh, you notice that in the passage in verse fifty nine it says uh, Rebecca and her nurse. And certainly that's not a medical nurse, but someone that cared for her. Uh, she was probably still. Uh, somewhat young and so this would have been a woman who was uh, like a servant to be with her but then also we'll go on uh, later and say uh, after they bless her with this great blessing uh, they'll talk about her and her maids so she's got someone who like cared for her but then her maids would be maybe other young ladies uh, so there's a little group that goes with her as her support um, the blessing that they speak over her is, a, I believe, a blessing from the Lord. Just like God would bless Abraham and say, I'm going to make you the father of many nations and your descendants will outnumber the sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky, those blessings. I bless you. You'll have this old land, stars you see, the north, the south, east, and the west. So far, this land will be yours and your descendants. All those are blessings from God. Well, here you notice the blessing that her family speaks over her may you sister become uh, thousands of ten thousands which means may you be very 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 fruitful right so not just uh may you have you know six kids <laughs> 
but may you have children and may there be such a blessing on you that your children and your children's children and so on and so on and so on just continue to multiply so that your descendants number in the tens of thousands upon thousands. It's a quite a blessing that they are praying over her. And not only that, but that they that her descendants would be victorious against their enemies. As you can tell, it says, and may your descendants possess the gate of those who hate them. So everybody that wants to come against her descendants, uh, her descendants will have victory over them is what the proclamation is. Hey, Chris. So, um, so they send her off with this blessing. Their maids and everybody load up on their camels and they head out on their way. Can I ask a good question? Yes. Uh, and it doesn't really do with much except for my curiosity. Whenever a woman gets taken from her family and is gone, taken that far away, do they get to visit their family again? Uh, most likely not. It's not that they were prohibited, except that the the finances, the amount of time it took, because you're talking about. In fact, I had I, I pulled this up to show you guys something. Uh, so here's the the land that we're talking a lot about. So the the trip that. Uh, this servant would have made to go get a wife would have been from here up around and into this land of Mesopotamia, right? Here's the state of Texas laid over this. So you can you can tell that though when we look at these maps, we don't really have a perspective how big or small it is. But this is our state. We know about the size of our state. It's a big state, right? I mean, when you measure from here to here, they say if you flip Texas this way, this ends up on the Canadian border. So Texas is pretty big, right? And so you can see the width here, and you're covering from this land all the way to the Persian Gulf, all the way to the Mediterranean and Israel. Um, you've got here a, a little thing that shows 200 miles. So Israel itself is only about 200 miles long. I mean, you're talking about the full length of Israel is the distance from Dallas to uh, Austin. Yeah. It's 200 miles. I checked it again today. It's 202 miles from Dallas to Austin. So that's the length. I mean, we're not talking about huge strides of land here. When you consider this whole region where the Bible stories take place is basically the size of Texas. Right? Mm -hmm. so, they weren't able to go straight across. They had to no, across. they had to go up and around because of the desert and Mount, very mountainous Mount rough region. Desert, right? Yeah, it's... It's pretty rough. This is a the land of Jordan has lots of mountains and things. El Paso to Denison. There you go. <laughs> Don't do love The other thing is by going up here, remember this is called the Fertile Crescent. Yeah. Right? And 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 notice you've got rivers, very big rivers, so that keeps a water source as you go along. And that's why the roots went yeah. up and down the way they did. So um, let's move on to uh, verse 62. They're just backtracking around now. Now, Isaac had come from uh, going to Ber Laharoi, for he was living in the Negev. And the Negev is right down in this area. If I flip uh, back here, uh, this is the region of the Negev. Now, that land that I said was about 200 miles, this is that land. This is the land of Israel, modern day and in ancient times. So you got your Dead Sea, the land of Jordan over here. And this is the Negev, this desert region. There's Beersheba and Be'er Laharoi is right in this region as well. So that's where he's at. And it says that they're coming back. Uh, Isaac went out to meditate in the field towards evening. And he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, camels were coming. Rebecca lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. She said to the servant, who is that man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, He is my master. Then she took her veil and covered herself. The servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. Then Isaac brought her to his mother Sarah's tent, and he took Rebekah, and she became his wife, and he loved her. Thus Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So we remember that as well. Last week we talked about when Sarah passed away, Abraham's wife. She passed away and how he would bought land from these uh, sons of Heth and the uh, field of uh, see, the cave of Mechvelah. 
uh, and, and he buried her in there. And I showed you guys what the tomb, the modern day tomb looks like, where Abraham and, I, and I, or where Sarah is buried. And so um, he takes her into his mother's tent, uh, which kind of shows uh, how uh, nomadic people, which is what they were, they traveled with the herds. They, they were sheep herders and had many flocks of camels and goats and everything else. When you read the, the other stories about Abraham, you get all that. So they traveled because their enormous flocks would eat up every bit of the grass and they would all die. So, so they're constantly moving to green pastures within a certain region. And so um, everything is a tent, not a firm brick and mortar type house. Or, so uh, his mother's tent is still intact. They're still uh, keeping it up in the region they're living in. And so he moves her into there. Let's go on to uh, chapter 25, verse one. Now Abraham took another wife once Sarah died her name was Keturah. Uh, she bore to him Zimran and Jokshan and Meven and Meven <coughs> and Ishbak and Shua. All right, so we've got Abraham having more children here. Not just Isaac, but more children out of this. And not just Ishmael. Remember, Ishmael was born out of Hagar way back before Isaac is born, right? So now with this new wife, Keturah, uh, who was probably a concubine like Hagar, who becomes a wife. In fact, one commentary I was reading said uh, it's <coughs> very likely that Keturah and Hagar were his concubines when Sarah was his wife, but that she became his wife later. Anyway, she has these sons. One of the sons' names is Midian. Does that sound like a familiar name in the Bible? Yes. Right? The reason I pulled up some new maps tonight is because I want to show you something here in a minute. I'm, let me go ahead and read a little further and then we're going to talk just for a moment about Midian. But she has these sons and then it goes on and says that Jokshan, one of the sons uh, that came, comes from Keturah, uh, he became the father of Sheba and Dedan. Now Sheba and Dedan are names that you may have heard of because they are mentioned in a prophecy about the end times in Ezekiel 38. And it talks about how Sheba and Dedan and Tarshish will unite together and there will be this great battle, right? Sheba and Dedan is modern day Saudi Arabia. Uh, so again, if we go back over uh, to one of these larger areas here, uh, this is Saudi Arabia, right in this area. And so um, you've, got, uh, you've got them. Some, one of the end times prophecy that Ezekiel prophesies is that this region will come against Israel in the last days. And I'm not going to chase that right now because we, we, will, we will go a whole other thing. And I can't do that. So um, you know how easy it is for me to get off track. Uh, then it goes on in verse 4 it says the sons of Midian were Ephah and Ephor and Hanak and Abidah and Eldah all these were the sons of Keturah now Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac why did he do that? because he was a chosen one Isaac is the chosen one right? <laughs> remember he it wasn't even about firstborn because Ishmael is actually a firstborn, but Ishmael is born to Hagar, who is a concubine. And God said, no, Ishmael will not be the one that my promise comes through. He's not the one. I'll still bless Ishmael. And if you were here that Wednesday when we talked about Ishmael, uh, him and his mom were sent out and they almost died. But an angel of the Lord came and took care of Ishmael and Hagar. And he comes on. He, be, he will become a great uh, a father of nations himself, he'll be very blessed in his own way, but he will not be the son of promise. He'll not receive the, uh, the full inheritance and blessing of Isaac. Isaac gets everything, but he says, uh, the, the passage says, Abraham gave all that he had to Isaac, but to the sons of his concubines, uh, Abraham gave gifts while he was still living. And then he sent them away from his son Isaac eastward to the land of the east. All right. So uh, why, why do you think Abraham 
would do this? Why would he send them away from Isaac? Well, he gave them gifts and sent them away so there would be a dispute over what he gave Isaac. Very true. They, you're, you're helping there not to be them looking at what he has. Um, think about it for the for the distant future, the land was given to Abraham and his descendants, but his descendants doesn't mean every single descendant of Abraham because it wasn't given to Ishmael, and it's not given to any of the sons that come out of Keturah. It's given to Isaac and his descendants, and then we'll watch that right now. We'll watch Jacob and Esau be born, but that land will not be given to Esau and his descendants. It'll be given to Jacob and his descendants. So there's this line of promise where these descendants will come out of. And then Jacob, of course, his name will change later in his life to Israel. Right. And he will have 12 sons, which become the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's who that land goes to, right? So we're watching the promise of God flow down to the, to the children of the descendants that God has chosen. And you can ask me the question, well, why did he choose this one or that one? Paul didn't have the answer and neither do I. <laughs> Paul said, who are you to question God? We don't know the answer. We just know he's God and we're not. That's all that we can say. We don't know. And we know that before Jacob or Esau did anything good or bad, God chose Jacob. So it has nothing to do with one being good and one being bad. God just made some choices and we don't understand why. And one day in heaven, you can ask him those questions. We'll keep moving. All right. Probably so won't have the guts to. Do what? Probably won't have, probably won't have the guts. Say. Probably so enamored with Jesus, we won't care why all these things happen the way they did. But there is a there is uh, and, and the New Testament refers back to these very times about God having elected and having chosen and selected and and this line running. Okay. So let's talk about Midian for just a moment because I pulled up the land of Midian uh, so that you could see it. It's right here. And I don't know if you remember, but in the, in the book of Exodus, Moses lives up in this area. If you remember, uh, Moses is born uh, and, and then put in a river, and then he becomes a child of Pharaoh, right? The daughter of Pharaoh raises him up. Uh, when he becomes older, he ends up killing and, and then fleeing for his life after he kills uh, an Egyptian. And then the word gets out. And then when he flees, he flees, and he flees to the land of Midian. And he will find uh, his father-in-law, which uh, his name becomes is Jethro. Uh, he will marry a daughter of Jethro's, who is a priest of Midian. That's why he's described in Exodus. This is that land. And I love this drawing. There's many, many maps of the Exodus, right? A lot of them will say that the crossing of the Red Sea happened in this region up in here. Uh, this is Goshen. This is the land that... Uh, the Pharaoh in the days of Joseph gave to uh, all the descendants of uh, all of Joseph's family, all of his sons, which were his 12 brothers, the 12 tribes of Israel. Remember Israel himself. Uh, he comes and travels and he ends up dying here. Uh, Joseph will die here. All their bones and their bodies will be taken back and buried in that tomb that I showed you last week, uh, the cave of Mechpelah. But this is that region, right? So the reason I say I love this is because here's the Red Sea that is known as the Red Sea. This is Egypt, this whole land. And many say, well, they crossed one of these little short, shallow areas, or maybe they crossed a lake. There's tons of theories on this. Some even might say they crossed down here at the shallow end of the Red Sea. But I watched a great documentary that's really, really new that has done amazing research. And it is, it is actually much more truthful to the land, to the routes, even to what the, the text says that the crossing of the Red Sea actually was a crossing of the Gulf of Aqaba, which is also known as the Red Sea. It is also known as the Red Sea. And uh, uh, anyway, so that because you've got to get to the land of Midian and on this map, you notice Mount Sinai is in the land of Midian because uh, that's where Moses went and then he would uh, go up on the Mount Sinai and all that. Most traditional maps I pull up a bunch of them. They will say that Mount Sinai is somewhere in this region. Um, we're not here to settle any of those matters. I mainly wanted to show you. Here's where Abraham lives. And he sends his sons far away. And so Midian, one of those sons, one that we hear a lot about. We don't know about all the rest where they all ended up. But we know Midian, he settles in this region. And it's just very interesting that 400... No, about 600 years later, uh, 
maybe 500 years later, uh, you've got a descendant of Abraham coming out of here and fleeing to Midian, <laughs> right? So this is family. <laughs> Jethro, a priest of Midian, is actually family with Moses. Wow. Of course, around here, everybody's family in a weird way. Because yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when that long ago, they all started out over here in the uh, Persian are they, Gulf. Are they the Midianites? Yeah, this is the, the Midianites. Midianites. The Midianites. The Midianites. You hear yeah. that a lot. Yeah. So you hear that a lot. Yeah. I like that map because I've always in my mind imagined it that I like that because it shows how long of a trek it was before they actually get to the Sea of Cross. Yeah. And when you think about Pharaoh coming up on him and stuff, in my mind, I guess because of the movie. Yeah. You yeah. know, they barely got out of town. Yeah. Here comes Pharaoh. Yeah. But they chased. There was a lot of uh, yeah. bitterness to and chase them that far. There is a well-established highway that has been there for a thousand years right across this part. And that's why they also think that Moses went across here um, and took the people. Um, and just to give you an idea of how big this is, or how small it is, let's go back to our Texas map, right? If I show you that arrowhead point right there, right? If I take you back to the, the Texas one, this is that arrowhead point. Wow. So consider that to Texas. It'd be like crossing this, right? Mm -hmm. and, and judging here, that's 200 miles. That's less than 200 miles across. It's more like 150 you would cross. So there's the land of Midian. And I'm, gonna, uh, I'm showing you this too because he goes here, but we're going to see some other names mentioned in a minute, and we're going to see kind of where they end up settling. So let's keep going. Uh, these are, this is verse 7 now, because uh, they were all sent eastward, it says, uh, away from Isaac. Uh, these are all the years of Abraham, verse 7, uh, all the years of his life that he lived, 175 years. So that's how long Abraham lived, and then he dies. Abraham breathed his last and died in a ripe old age, an old man and satisfied with life, and he was gathered to his people. Then his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Mechvelah in the field of Ephraim, the son of Zohar the Hittite, facing Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased from the sons of Heth. There Abraham was buried with Sarah, his wife. All right, so we, we just read about that last week. We, we know that. So now we know the cave he bought. Not only is Sarah buried there, but now we know Abraham has been buried there. And we also get an interesting fact that Ishmael comes back into the story, right? We might think, well, Ishmael went off and he nobody ever hears about him again. But to kind of answer a little bit of Ashley's question, family stayed connected in some ways. And, and so word would go and, and maybe for a big funeral or something like that, people might travel a long distance for something like a great patriarch like Abraham. Because these two brothers come back together uh, and then you can imagine there had to be a little bit of issue when Ishmael is sent off with a lesser blessing and Isaac is the one who gets it all. Um, but they came together to bury dad and, uh, and then they will bury him in the same tomb with Sarah uh, there uh, real close to Hebron. Uh, right up in this area is where uh, that cave is at. Okay, so then it says... Uh, it came about after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac, and Isaac lived by Berla Haroi, which is again in the Negev, like we talked about earlier. Now, these are the records of the generations of Ishmael. So Ishmael is not a key player, though he has a, a bit of a story as uh, really the first son of Abraham, but not by the right woman. He's not the one that God chose. So we're going to see, this will be kind of the wrapping up of Ishmael outside of, we know the Ishmael lights, we'll hear about that and things like that. But this kind of wraps up uh, Ishmael for us in Genesis. It says, now these are the records of the generations of Ishmael. Abraham's son from Hagar, the Egyptian, Sarah's maid bore to Abraham. And these are the names of the sons of Ishmael by their names in the order of their birth. Now y'all just pray for me as I read these. <laughs> Nebioth, the firstborn of Ishmael, and Kedar, and Adbil, and Mibsem, and Mid Mishma, and Duma, and Masa, Hadad, and Tima, Jeter, Nefish, and Kadima. 
These are the sons of Ishmael, and these are their names by their villages and by their camps. Twelve princes according to their tribes. These are the twelve princes that will make up the Arab nations for the most part. There are some Arab nations that don't come from them, but most of them do. He goes on and says, um, these, are the years, these are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years, and he breathed his last and died and was gathered to his people. They settled, in, uh, settled from Havilah to Shur, which is east of Egypt. As one goes toward Assyria, he settled in defiance of all his relatives. So, don't know, I, I read a little in some commentary about what that might mean, the defiance of his relatives, uh, differing opinions. Not, nobody seemed to be really great about that. But uh, there's a route on the, land, or on the way to land of Shur that goes right through this region. Um, this is called the wilderness of Shur. And so it's... Uh, it's likely right in this region uh, is where he settled early on. So maybe right in the middle out here away from them. But it doesn't seem like uh, Ishmael and his descendants go too far. So that would have been easy for him to come back for the funeral. Um, all right. What was that last sentence you, you uh, had there in that, in that 18th verse? 18th verse. He died. died. It says, they settled from Havilah to Shur which is east of Egypt, as one goes toward Assyria, he settled in defiance of all his relatives. Wow. Mine says he died in the presence of all his relatives. What can you do? Really? Yes. In the presence. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. I didn't take the time to look up what no, the I Hebrew didn't. word was, but we could yeah, well, another this, day. This is King James. <laughs> he died in the presence of them? That's presence what the King James is saying. Yeah, it says and, all, all the presence of his brethren. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very big difference. Yeah. The presence defiance and defiance. Like they don't even sound right. It's the same meaning. <laughs> no. Weird. No uh, i got to watch the clock. We're going to uh, stop in about seven minutes and then take prayer requests because I really have to get on the road uh, to get up into Oklahoma tonight. Uh, now these are the records of the generations of Isaac. Verse 19. Abraham's son... Abraham became the father of Isaac. And Isaac was 40 years old when he took Rebekah. Now th listen to these ages. He's 40 years old on that, at that time when Rebekah comes back with that servant, that story we just read about between last week and this week. Uh, when he took Rebekah, the daughter of Bethuel, the Aramean of Padan Aram, the sister of Laban, the Aramean, to be his wife. Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If it is so, why then am I this way? So she went to inquire of the Lord. The Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb, and two peoples will be separated from your body and one people shall be stronger than the other and the older shall serve the younger that's the answer to her prayer she's wondering why these twins are fighting it out inside her right and so she asks the lord and the lord says you have two nations inside of you and um one's going to be stronger than the other and and he, so there's this prophecy that's just been spoken to rebecca now this is important. She's praying this while they're still in the womb because we won't get there tonight on exactly, uh, I know most of you know the story. Yeah. If I tell you what Rebecca and Jacob con yeah. conspired to do, right? You remember that story? Yeah. Right. Well, if you wonder what stirred in Rebecca to tell her son to go deceive his father, I would say it's this word from the yeah. Lord that the younger, uh, the the older will serve the younger. So there's a there's a prophecy from God that this is going to happen. Now, she trusted God, God gave the answer, but didn't trust Him to do it. Exactly. <laughs> we God is the one who gets to sort out why deception was used and all that. But uh, so the first one that she gave birth to, she knew would not be. She knew he would end up serving the younger. Yes. Yeah. And she wow. she she preferred Jacob and yeah. the the dad. 
uh, like Isaac preferred one. Esau, right? So we'll get, we're going to read that right now. Um, it said, when her, when her days to be delivered were fulfilled, behold, there were twins in her womb. Now the first came forth red, all over, hairy like a garment. Okay. Uh, verse 25. Yeah, that's what we just read. So remember, there's no sonograms. There's no things where you can look and see the 3D, 4D images of babies and all the stuff we get now. You know, there's no tests to know if they're boys and girls. There's none of that stuff. So when she, all this moving around is going in, in her belly, she starts praying, God, what's going on? He says, you got two nations in you. And when, she's, when, when she gives birth, she finds out, oh, wow, I have twins, right? She figures it out. That's it's always a surprise. And so when she has the babies, uh, the first one comes forth red and he's hairy all over, all over like a hairy garment. So a hairy garment means like an animal skin. Can you imagine that? Um, it's like what we would say, there's actually a, a, a medical term and I can't remember the name of it now. Um, and it's like a, a wolf man. People actually have hair all over them yeah. Um, and, and it's uh, a genetic thing. Um, but he comes out, he's red and he's hairy all over. Like a garment, a, a hairy garment. Um, afterward, verse 26, afterward his brother came forth with his hand <coughs> holding on to Esau's heel. So his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when he gave birth to them. So when we put together that Isaac was 40 when Rebecca comes on that camel, 20 years, 20 years she was barren. From the time he married her until the time that these twins are born, 20 years go by. That's why Isaac is praying for his wife because she's barren. Married 20 years without a child. He bound to be concerned and so is she. And knowing that uh, his mother prayed for a long time before she had a child and really was 90. He's like, God, please don't do a repeat. I don't want my wife to be 90 and me to be 99 when we have kids. Mm -hmm. So he got to be 60, not 99. <laughs> so he's thankful. 30 years earlier than dad. All right. So when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter. This is verse 27. A man of the field. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in tents. Now, Isaac loved Esau because he had a taste for game. But Rebekah loved Jacob. When, the, when Jacob had cooked stew, Esau came in from the field and he was famished. And Esau said to Jacob, please let me have a swallow of that red stuff there, for I am famished. Therefore, his name was called Edom. Because he wanted to eat them up. <laughs> That's my best comedian joke I've ever So, you notice this right here? Yeah. Edom. Right? This is the land of the descendants of Esau. They're on this side. Remember, here's Jerusalem, which in, in this time period is Jebus, but it'll become Jerusalem. So, here's your land of Israel. Here's where. Uh, <coughs> Beersheba is where Abraham lived. He lived between the Hebron and Beersheba, and this region is where he did all his sheep herding and everything. All the stories about Abraham are right in this area. <coughs> Berhalaroi is right in the same general area. This is called the Negev. So Esau, Jacob's brother, because Jacob will stay in this area for, well, we'll get to that. Edom will move over to this area. This is important because later on, 500 years later, when Israel is here and all these sons produce a nation and then the exodus happens, the plagues happen, they come out, they'll come in, they'll pass through all the land of descendants that came out of Abraham. These are family members, just distant cousins. So, all right. Verse 31 says, but Jacob said, first sell me your birthright. All right, so remember, Jacob, he likes to go out and take a nice, nice healthy goat, a little <clears throat> lamb, or, and he'll slaughter it. He'll make him up some real good stew and some potatoes and things. 
he he likes to cook. He stays home. He doesn't go out and in the woods and hunt and things. He he likes to stay home and and, and take care of that. Right. He's mama's boy. He's mama's boy. <laughs> so his brother comes in. He's been hunting and he's famished. Hungry. He's hungry. When he comes in, Jacob is a little bit of a. His name even means it. He's a little bit of a trickster. Okay. Um, and and so he's his brother's begging him. He's like, I am famished. Give me some of that red stuff. Jacob says, first, sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I am about to die. Now, how many of you think Esau's really about to die? No. I'll guarantee you that man ate this morning before he went hunting. He's just hungry, right? He's not going to die. But he says, and, and this is where you see what, what is about to unfold here. And, and what he doesn't realize is that God is listening to everything that's about to come out of Esau's mouth. Jacob says, first sell me your birthright. Esau said, behold, I'm about to die. So, so of what use then is my birthright to me? Now, if the man was really going to die, he's got a point. But he's not really going to die. He's just been out hunting. He's walking around. He's got lots of stages before he dies. Somebody's going to walk up and help him eat before he dies. But he's way over exaggerating. And he said, well, what good's a birthright if I die? So, yeah. What, do you mean, what does he mean as birthright? All right. The birthright is this. It was very important in this time. The firstborn had the birthright. And so the inheritance went to the firstborn. Didn't mean that lesser ones would get something, but they wouldn't get the big thing, right? They didn't get the blessing of the father. And so um, a blessing was very important, especially when it was a blessing that God was speaking through a father. And you will, next week we'll see that as we watch what happens, because this story is going to unfold more, and you'll see more what that birthright entails. Um, a birthright should be cherished. You should cherish that you have this, that you were born first and it's yours. But notice he's willing to sell his for a bowl of stew. Yeah. And all he needs to do is go kill his own animal, cook it and eat it, and he's fine. He probably could have go begged something from his mom or somebody else, but he he just wants it. So he wants it. He's living by his story. He cooks quite well. Yeah. His dad. He does. His dad loves his cooking, so he's not a bad cook. Yeah. He, he says that. Yeah, he didn't value his birthright. That's right. And so Jacob says, first swear to me. And he swore to him and he sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of stew. Now, I can guarantee you Esau is thinking, who cares? It's just words. Man, I'm going to die. Yeah, you can have my birthright. But he knows that later he's going to take that back. Yeah. There's no eyewitnesses. He didn't sign any papers, right? But God heard. And so things are going to unfold next week. Yeah. And we're going to see how they unfold. But let me finish up that chapter. Then Jacob gave Esau bread and lentil soup. And he ate and drank and rose and went on his way. Thus Esau despised his birthright. Yeah. All right. So remember that because next week you're going to see the consequences of him despising his birthright and how things will unfold.